So, what did you guys think of the article? Awesome. <laughs> An awesome article, yes, sir. It was tough to pinpoint All right, it wasn't it? Interesting. Let's delve into that in more detail here, right? Because that's, that's going to be our first question we're going to be answering here. So, um, let us go to our random number generator. I feel the anxiety building in the room. <laughs> Who's it going to be? Number 39. Hopefully, everyone knows their number by now. I might randomize it. Asahel. My friend. Stand up. Stand up. Okay. All right. Shh. Now stand up, sir, so you can shout your answers from the rooftops. You'll have an answer. I guarantee you will. Okay. So let's talk about this study. So we were looking at treatment of hyperkalemia in the emergency department. What do you think the hypothesis was of the study? Very difficult to pinpoint. Um, they were mentioning about the different treatments. Okay. As far as if the different treatments did have an effect in lowering the potassium. Okay. Versus they didn't really have. So, so you'd say the null hypothesis is what? I wouldn't say not effective, but you could say there's no difference between the different treatments. Yeah, so that, in that case, you say that's the null hypothesis. Um, you could say that, you know, um, these researchers, their hypothesis might have been, you know, we want to see if a treatment maybe is more efficacious or not, right? Or if there's a particular, um, you know, one treatment that everyone does, or there's one thing that's more prominent than others, right? So again, uh, this was tough because it was more of an observational study. It wasn't a straightforward randomized controlled trial like you would see like in other things where you could say that yes, definitively, here's our null hypothesis, here's the hypothesis, right? So that is a little bit more difficult, but very nice answer. Thank you so much. You can sit down. So have you guys covered how to manage hyperkalemia yet? can't remember if you did. <laughs> so does anyone know how to treat hyperkalemia right off the bat? Yes, sir. Okay, so so um, there's, a, there's a lot of different options here. But again, now, did anyone actually go and do a little bit extra research to find out, okay, well, what the heck are we even reading here? Like, what, how do we treat hyperkalemia? Okay, so, yep, so that's one thing. You're talking about insulin helping to drive potassium into the cells. So that's the thing. Like, we know in rotations... And you go out there and your preceptor says, hey, I need, you know, what's this, uh, what's the best treatment for this disease state? And you didn't cover it in class. What are you going to tell him or her? Let me go look that up, right? Let me go find out. You can't just say, well, we didn't cover it in school. I have no idea. <laughs> Not a great answer, right? So you're going to be asked to look up things on the fly. And this is a skill that you're going to develop and you're going to use the rest of your life um, on how to find information quickly, how to read up on the subjects. So that way you can at least sound somewhat confident when you're giving your answers back. So you may not have or may not have covered hyperkalemia yet, but hopefully you went and at least did a little bit of reading. The article gave you a little bit of information about some of the different modalities we're going to use here as far as how to manage it, right? So just a little brief crash course in hyperkalemia. We talked about different treatments here. And so um, one way that I used to remember the different treatments for hyperkalemia is a nice mnemonic, okay? And so the mnemonic that I use, I'll just write it out here, uh, is C, A, big K, drop. That's my mnemonic that I use for hyperkalemia. And so you say, well, what the heck does that mean? I have no idea. Does anyone know what the C means? Calcium. Calcium, right? Calcium is one of the treatments I talked about in here. Calcium helps to stabilize the myocardium, hopefully to prevent an arrhythmia from occurring in the first place. Anyone know what the A stands for? Albuterol. Albuterol, which they classify as beta-2 agonist here, but albuterol is the main one. There's another one called terbutaline you can use occasionally, but albuterol is a big one. Um, how about the big? I can figure out what that means. How about the B in big? Bicarbonate, yeah. Sodium bicarbonate, by alkalinizing the blood, you help to drive potassium back into the cells. Beta-2 agonists do the same thing by activating beta-2 receptors. You drive potassium into the cells. So that way not as much of it's in the blood and can't really affect the myocytes as much. How about the Ig? Insulin and glucose, right? You always want to give insulin and glucose together because if I just give insulin, what happens? The bottom out of their blood sugar, right? They get hypoglycemic, which, again, is an important thing to consider when we talked about the adverse outcomes from, from some of the uh, treatments here. Um, again, that helps to drive potassium into the cell, okay? The K actually stands for, anyone know what this might stand for? K 
K-exalate, yeah. So there's uh, when they talk about SPS or that sodium polystyrene sulfonate, that's actually a product that we give, and it's a drug we haven't talked about yet because we haven't really talked about hyperkalemia. But it's a drug that will actually give you the orally or rectally, and it's a it's a resin. It's an exchange resin where basically it'll give it'll donate sodium, but it will pick up potassium through the GI tract. Um, and so that way we're not necessarily shuttling potassium into the cells; we're actually getting rid of it. Okay which is a big difference than what we're seeing with some of these other drugs that only shuttle potassium into the cells. This is actually one of the things to get rid of it. Yes, sir? Sorry, did you say again the K? K-exalate is the, the brand name for the drug, right? So sodium polystyrene sulfonate is the generic or the SPS, which you saw in the article. Uh, K-exalate is the brand name, so that's what we use for the mnemonic here. And then anyone with the, the D in dro drop stands for? Dialysis, right? Dialysis does what for us? Basically an artificial kidney, right? Hook them up to it, filter out the blood, get rid of the potassium, okay? So again, looking at this, we see there's only a couple of things that actually get rid of the potassium. A lot of the other things actually just shift it around into the cells. Now, is that a definitive therapy? No, because again, they're ultimately still hyperkalemia. They still have too much potassium in, in the bloodstream. All right, so there's your brief crash course on how we manage hyperkalemia. Um, so now we can go back to the article and kind of get some more information there, okay? So let us do another random call here. Let's see, number seven. Kyle, stand on up, sir. Yes, you know, stand up so you can. Yeah, so the, the next question we're asking here is what is the actual design of the study? It's a uh, multi center prospective observational study. Okay, what does that mean? Uh, it means that we used a few different hospitals, multi centers. Okay. And we looked at um, patient outcomes, prospective, or okay. we had patients come in. And then we looked at their outcomes observational, but we didn't give them any specific experimental like choices to do, like insulin or anything. We just used whatever their protocol was for testing up with the pepper mm -hmm. and Was there a protocol involved with this? I don't think there's any specific protocol. They're just mm -hmm. possible to have their own protocol. Exactly. Well, maybe they didn't, right? That's one of the things we'll, we'll see a little bit later on, right? So good. So it was multi-center, which means we use different hospitals. You can sit down. Thank you. Um, we were as prospectives. So we were looking forward in time. Okay, and it was purely observational, right? So again, and you're going to see this when we get into the actual um, the results and whatnot. Was there a whole lot of cause and effect sort of analysis we can pull from this? Is there anything we can really say this is going to be the best treatment option? Right. The best way we could do that is, is holding what kind of trial? Randomized control trial, right? In this case, what if I was designing a randomized control trial for the best treatment for hyperkalemia, what would my control be? No treatment? No treatment? Standard treatment. Standard treatment, interesting. So why would no treatment not be appropriate? <laughs> if my patient dies on me because I did not give them any treatment, that is considered unethical, right? So again, a lot of times you're going to find the study design is going to be dictated based off uh, oftentimes what the standard treatment is going to be, and then you're trying a new experimental treatment or something different, right? And so in this case, I could say, well, standard treatment would be getting calcium, insulin, glucose, and eventually dialysis. And now I'm going to just say, well, what if I just give them that, but I also add it on? KXLA, right? So by changing up a little bit, that will give you, uh, you know, a better comparator there, right? I can't just give them no treatment. And again, that's why a lot of these studies are really hard to do because you can't get really those kind of nice fair comparisons there. Uh, if you look at a tox study, you'll notice we don't do any randomized controlled trials for the most part because again, I can't give um, you know, patients who overdose on acetaminophen placebo because guess what? They die from liver failure. That's on me, right? So we can't really do a lot of those studies uh, do the ethics of it. So anyway, so we said, okay, so it's an uh, observational study, so there's no actual direct, um, you know, uh, impact that the investigators are having. How do they actually collect their information? Anyone know? The people that were 18 years or older that came into the ED with hyperkalemia. Okay, so that's how we got our patients, but again, how are they actually getting the information itself? Hmm? Yeah, reported data. So again, they were doing the investigators actually had you know surveys that they were doing. They were following up on these patients, and that's how they were kind of collecting their information in the first place. Good. Um, so where were the study? Where are the hospitals at? Does that matter? The academic facility. Okay. So we have an academic facility. What does that mean, really? Yeah, usually like, hospitals associated with the university, usually they have like research programs. Again, what kind of people are working at a uh, university hospital? 
you have some PhDs, you could have a lot of students, you could have a lot of uh, residents, that's where a lot of residency programs are going to be at. So you typically have a lot of younger providers. So again, that's going to be skewing it. You know, so for instance, if I was at a university hospital, say for instance, you're at UF Health in Gainesville, working there versus if I was working on like Podunk Hospital in the middle of nowhere, you got one doc who's on call in the panhandle, you might have a little bit different treatment, right? So again, you're trying to think about, like, okay, well, who are my providers here? You know, especially if they're not following any particular protocol, you may find they have a little bit different um, treatment ideas. If you have, a, if you're skewing younger, you may have different treatments than if you had, let's say, older providers who are working here. So certain, some things to start thinking about. Now, where are these big university hospitals normally located? Usually, more urban type of environments, right? So, what, how do you think that could change your data? How about the type of patients you might be seeing, right? So, for instance, if I'm in a dense urban sort of area, how do you think I may skew my patients? How about from an ethnicity standpoint? The article talks about this. It tends to skew a little bit more African American. Maybe have fewer Caucasian patients who are being involved here. So that's one thing you'll actually see that gets borne out in the data here. Did anyone actually look to see where these uh, hospitals were? Now, that's something you might want to uh, consider taking a look at, right? Because then, again, that can skew your data, right? So, again, if you're particularly working in the southeast area and these are hospitals that had no representation there, that may not be completely uh, applicable to you, right? Now, in this case, hyperkalemia is hyperkalemia. It doesn't really matter where you're practicing at. However, if it's something a little bit more regional-based, if it's like something with a particular infectious disease, that could make a difference. Now, where would I find that information at? Hmm? So they tell you specifically, so if you actually look at the article itself, they'll say where they were getting their participants from and said, um, see supplementary material, right? Did anyone actually go look, look up the supplementary material? That's okay, because I did for you. So if you actually go back to where, if you, you can just Google the article and actually pull up the, the information for it. But basically, um, they give you the uh, where the investigators were at, the study sites, and the number of patients they enrolled here. So if you notice, you have things like Dallas, Texas. You have things like um, uh, Detroit, Michigan. You have things like um, Houston, Texas. So again, that can kind of give you an idea of uh, geographically where were the patients kind of located at, right? And then, so that may give you an idea, were they more rural areas? Were they more urban areas? And so oftentimes, the researchers will kind of talk about that in the, in the article. And so that's something they can introduce what into the study. If the geography is playing a role here, is it influencing the outcomes? What do you call that? Yeah, it could be confounder, it could be bias you're introducing into the study, right? So again, you could be biasing towards one type of patient or another. Just like we said, we're going to see a higher proportion of African American patients versus Caucasian patients. And that could be due to the fact that we're recruiting from hospitals in these more dense sort of urban areas. So one thing to think about. Okay, and authors should be addressing this, which they do, if you read through the study carefully, right? Okay, so what's our next question? Uh, all right, what is the independent variable, what's the dependent variable, and what type of variables are these? So who are we going to call on next? Number 45, who's 45? Stephanie Graham. Oh, yeah. So it's just starting out, we'll ask a few people these questions. What do you think is the independent variable in this case here? Be the potassium what? So would that be the independent or the dependent variable? What do you think? What is the independent variable? How would you define that? So it's the thing that is not being, um, it's not really the outcome that we're looking at. This is the thing that people get kind of categorized when they come into the study on. So again, what? Yeah, so the, in this case, it would actually be the potassium level, right? So that would be kind of our independent variable here. Saying, And again, this is tough because it's not like an experimental trial. We're actually you know, comparing things together. This is purely just observational. So we're having to make a bit of a stretch here. Um, so in this case, we'd actually be looking at our independent variables, people coming in, what their potassium level is, right? And we mentioned that you know they uh, did some breakdowns where they had people greater than seven, you know, six to seven. All of that was our independent variable and how we're categorizing patients as they're coming into the study. Thank you very much. You may sit. Oh, and, and um, briefly, what would you, consider that nominal, ordinal, is that continuous? Is it nominal? Or is it ordinal or continuous, what do you think? Anyone can help her out? So it's continuous if you're specifically looking at, say, 5.3 versus 4.2, but what do these people, uh, what do the researchers do? They broke them up into categories, right? So you had greater than seven, you maybe because you remember they're looking at more moderate cases. So I said, you know, if you're between like five and six, for instance, or if you're six to seven, what do you consider that at that point? Then it turns into ordinal, right? Because there's an order to that, right? You know, uh, greater than seven 
is greater, you know, is bigger than six to seven, right? Uh, there's an order to it, but again, you're breaking down into the bigger categories. And so in that case, it turns into an ordinal sort of variable, right? So kind of keep in mind, you're looking at these things, you know, is it ordinal, is it nominal? What, what, what is the type of variable? Okay, um, so next up, number 20, who is that? All right, Alexander, stand on up. So what would you consider to be the dependent variable in this case? <laughs> so, okay, so that could be one thing. So the type of treatments that the patient experienced, right? So that could be considered um, uh, one of our dependent variables, right? Because, again, it's one of those things that, you know, we just categorize patients as, as an independent variable based off their potassium levels. Kind of what happened to them afterwards is more of a dependent sort of variable there, right? So, again, the type of treatment they received. Uh, and then how would you categorize that? What type of variable? Yeah, it would be definitely more of a nominal, right? So I can't say calcium is more or less than insulin and glucose, or more or less than dialysis, right? So again, that would be considered nominal in those cases there. Um, how about what other dependent variables do we see? Okay, so that kind of along the same lines as therapy. What else do we look at? So we looked at their initial potassium levels, and then what do we look at afterwards? Yeah, so what were the potassium levels afterwards, right? So they actually were able to look at what the change was from the initial ones up to that four-hour mark was the other thing they were looking at, right? And how would you consider that? What, what type of variable? That In that case, it's more continuous, right? Because we're actually looking at the actual absolute difference between what the initial was and then what the follow was, right? Anyone, everyone kind of getting that feel for the difference between like an ordinal versus the nominal, how they kind of classify it? Very good. Thank you. Um, okay, good. So then how were patients included or excluded from the trial? So again, going back to our inclusion ex exclusion criteria, number 14, who is that? We're going to include you I'm talking about this. Emily? You going to stand up? I love the begrudging, like, oh, let me just move my chair out. <laughs> Everyone does it. It's okay. So uh, in this case, how do we include uh, patients? How do we um, identify those patients to include in the trial? Why, why is it important that we have only patients greater than 18? Um, so, they can mm, so they can give consent. Also, it makes it much less uh, difficult from a, a research uh, standpoint when you have kids or any of these like protected classes, like if you have like prisoners or pregnant patients or anything like that, it gets much more difficult from a, uh, an ethical standpoint. Um, and so that's why usually you'll see these studies just relegated just to adult patients, right? So you know, kids could be hyperkalemic, but uh, it's just more of a sticky situation. So we just focus on the adults, right? Um, good. Any other inclusion criteria? Okay, yeah, so then that gets into kind of more of the exclusion criteria of, like, do we actually have the follow-up data, right? Because, again, if we didn't, then that uh, information is no good. Um, okay, thank you. Let me sit down. Um, good, so, again, we want to have patients who are identified as being hyperkalemic. Now, do they need to come in with a complaint that is consistent with hyperkalemia? No. Okay. So they was just if they measured a level and it was high, then you got included in the study. Um, now, what do you think about as far as like? Do you think you're gonna have like more daytime patients, evening patients, nighttime patients? Do you think it's gonna ever play a role? It can. When do you think a lot of these patients are gonna be taken from? What time of day do you think? I mean, it's not for the reason you think. It's not like hyperkalemia just like ma magically manifests at a certain time of day. Afternoon. Okay, so that may influence when people actually come in, certainly. Um, this actually goes back to the logistics of the study. A lot of times you're going to find studies will normally pull their patients during the daytime period, because that's when you actually have investigators who are working who can actually do the, the work um, to collect all the data and, and to um, actually get the patients included. Um, for instance, we were doing a trial with a, a new type of uh, uh, pit viper antivenom at the hospital I was working at when I was doing my fellowship, and we just didn't have any patients that came in overnight mainly because there's no one there working who actually could do all the paperwork and get the patient enrolled and all that sort of stuff, get consent and all these different things. So because of that, we didn't really have any overnight patients. Now, do snakes care what time of day it is to bite people? No, and again, when are people usually out drinking and picking up snakes? Usually in the evening time, right? So again, we'd have we'd miss a lot of patients because of that. And so again, that can again skew your data depending on what you're looking at, different things like that. So actually the logistics of the trial can actually make a, uh, play a difference here. And again, um, do you think in this case they caught every single patient that came into that hospital with hyperkalemia? 
No, because again, who would you miss? If you never run a BMP on them, you'd never get the, that information right. If you never ran a potassium level, you would never know. So you may be underreporting these cases. And again, if you have fewer patients, what does that do to your study? Makes it harder, harder to show any differences, right? You may have an underpowered sort of trial, which isn't really a big deal here because we'll talk about some of our uh, outcome measures in just a little bit. Okay, um, let's talk about exclusion criteria. Let's do number 31. All right, Niana? Yes, what do you think about the exclusion criteria? Um, who, who might that be? Who do you think might not be able to consent? Perfect. Okay. Um, if they were participating in another study, um, that could impact the serum potassium, or if they had already previously enrolled in one of these reviewed um, studies. Why, why is that important? If they had, because it could alter the potassium levels from when they come in, so it could not be like. Well, no, um, so specifically, like, why do you not want to have someone who's been in the trial before? Could why why could it confound it? Exactly right. Remember, we're talking about like independent versus dependent sort of measurements there. By making sure we're only counting each person once, we're going to find that um, you have those independent sort of observations there. When you have a dependent observation like that, that can skew the data, can confound it. Because if someone has a really difficult to treat hyperkalemia, or they're coming in for the same thing, um, say it's the same person who keeps missing their dialysis appointments on Friday, and they keep coming into the ER on Monday morning because they're hyperkalemic, um, that may skew the data, right? It may look to see like, okay, well, dialysis had a bigger role to play here because that person just came in, got dialyzed, and they're potassium came down like well no duh they were dependent on dialysis in the first place okay so absolutely so again that's why we want to have make sure of independent observations and not repeat any people uh, any other uh, exclusion criteria mm -hmm. yeah because you can't measure anything so yeah it's the biggest thing and then also note and you may sit down thank you um also note that um, as far as the severity of the hyperkalemia did they take every single person that came in with a potassium of 5.3 no, why do, what do they do? Those they limited the number of mild hyperkalemia to just about 50 patients or so, and then they really were just looking at patients who had higher potassium, say greater than six. Why do you, why do you think they would do that? Yeah, why would they limit the number of mild cases of hyperkalemia they were involving in the study? Why even include them at all? Not necessarily. I think, and this could be up for interpretation. I think it's probably due to the fact that they just wanted to make sure they had enough people to actually make some, uh, actually get some data. So again, they said, well, at least do 50. If we can get above that, then that's great. Because a lot of times with these trials, you're going to find that it's hard to enroll patients. And so um, by at least including that 50, at least we'll at least about 50 patients with hyperkalemia. And again, where it's more common to see someone with a potassium of 5.3 or someone with a potassium of 7. Those mild cases are probably more common than you'd run into than someone had a really hyperkalemic uh, level there, right? So again, um, that's probably to just help with the enrollment numbers there. And then by focusing on the the more severely hyperkalemic patients, um, they're more likely to get treatment, right? So again, someone comes in with a potassium of 5.2, are you going to likely do something about that? Probably not. Versus if they come with a potassium of 7, you should probably do something about that before your patient dies, right? That makes sense. And you'll get a feel for that as you kind of get used to looking at these labs a little bit more uh, frequently. Anyway, so um, moving on next. So now we have an idea of who we're including in the study, who we're excluding from the study, and why, why do we care about that? Yeah, to see if it applies to our patient, right? So if I'm dealing with a hyperkalemic patient who's coming into the ER, does this apply, right? So for instance, if I am working at Nemours and I have a six-year-old come in, with hyperkalemia, is there anything I can take from this study that is useful here? Probably not, right? Or not as much useful information because, again, they didn't look at any kids. So I don't know if our kids going to be different as how they respond to these treatments. Maybe. Um, this trial is not going to be able to tell me that. Does that kind of make sense? So, again, how we're going to be able to apply this back? And what do you call that when you talk about the, uh, the ability to take this information and apply it to your individual patient? Hmm? Um, whether it's clinically significant, not quite. It's going to be the generalizability, right? How general can I take this information and generalize it out to the patient I'm dealing with? You're going to see that this, you know, only had how many patients involved in it? 
like 200 patients, right? The one we're going to do tomorrow has thousands of patients. You're going to find the generalizability changes whether you're doing just a few patients or you're doing with a whole uh, host of patients, right? So in this case here, they may limit the generalizability by only looking at 200 some odd people, right? And again, when you're looking at the time frame, notice here it's a pretty short period of time here, only about you know, um, you know, five, six, seven months. They're actually looking at this, okay? And so because of that, it may limit how many people they got enrolled as well, okay? Okay. Up next, what question do we have next? I can find my mouse. Okay. Um, all right. So, what were the outcome measures of the study? Thirteen. Andrew. You stand up uh, for us. Okay. <laughs> You have a couple to choose from. What do you think? What's that? You have a couple of different outcome measures to, to choose from. Yeah, so we talked about um, medications that patients were previously taking. Um, yes, you want to include that, right? So again, um, well, what, what kind of did that get rolled into as well? Uh, sort of like the reasons why they're hyperkalemic, right? Because again, that was and that was at the discretion of the the treating provider to say, like, okay, well, were they hyperkalemic because of ACE inhibitors? They hyperkalemic because of they missed dialysis, whatever the case may be, right? Okay, what else? Um, so like the change in potassium levels, um, side effects, um, treatment modalities. Mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, those are the big ones, right? Yeah, so. Yeah, so yeah, they were looking at all the, 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 the demographics of the patients they were including there. They were looking at the actual changes in potassium, right? They were looking at the treatment modalities. Um, you know, obviously the ones we probably consider the most clinically important are going to be that change of potassium, I would think, and then how many different treatment uh, they were actually getting there, right? Okay, good, thank you. Um, and again, we'll talk about the actual results of the study in just a second here, but um, how do they actually analyze the data here? What sort of statistical tests did they do? You're absolutely right. They didn't really do any, right? <laughs> they were just really, just purely observational, right? They were just looking to see, like, okay, well, what was the actual, what actually happened here, right? And you notice there's no comparisons. They, they didn't look at, um, you know, they didn't generate any p-values here to look at the difference between if you got four treatments versus five treatments, how much better did you do, right? Because, again, do you think they were powered to find any of that information? Not really. They only had 200 some odd patients, and again, it was very difficult to to get enough inform uh, to information to actually make a good comparison there. So you're going to find that really, were any of these results statistically significant? No, because they didn't do any comparisons there, right? However, could we find some results here that may be clinically significant? Quite possibly, right? So we can get dig into that and kind of see um, what we think about that. Okay. Okay. So let's talk about some of the results of the study here and getting into it. Talked about that. Uh, okay, so let's look at the, some of the tables here, and so I'm going to call on someone to kind of help me kind of work through some of these and see what they see what we think. Yes, sir. So when you actually have a comparison, right, when you're actually doing like a t-test or you're doing a chi-square test or something where you're actually generating a p-value, that's where I can determine whether something is statistically significant or not. This is purely just observational, so it's purely just reporting on the numbers of what they actually found, right? Um, so again, they're not making any um, uh, any assumptions or making any assertions that this treatment is better than this treatment anything like that. They're just basically just reporting on what they found in the study here, right? And again, it's a much easier type of study to do, but we'll find that, you know, we can't really take a whole lot from it necessarily. Um, however, they describe this as a, a pilot study. Anyone know what a pilot study means? Only airport personnel were involved in the study? No, it's a, it's a smaller study, usually easier to run that you may not have a whole lot of information you can pull from it, but it gives you an idea of like, okay, well, if we wanted to expand this out, is this a good idea or not, right? And so again, this would give us information to say, well, if we want to maybe do another study, how are we going to do that from there? And so this is what these pilot studies are, are used for, right? You use it in a smaller number of patients uh, uh, or a smaller set of data, and then you expand it out from there, okay? Anyway, so let's call on someone to help us out with these results here. Number eight. All right, Amelia? You already knew it was you? You already knew your lucky number? Okay, so let's work through the, the characteristics of the patient here. Kind of what do you think... Um, anything interesting you pulled out of this? Uh, 
Mm -hmm. Okay. But from the findings, are there anything interesting that you noted? Okay, good. Yeah, because again, if people are coming in frequently for hyperkalemia, they're probably going to do what? They're probably going to come in again, right? You know, especially if they're particularly sensitive to whatever the case may be that initially kind of set them over the edge for being hyperkalemic. Any other findings you thought were interesting? Just the demographics of patients? Okay. So you're looking at the CKD stages, what do you notice here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the higher they were, the more likely they were to be coming in for hyperkalemia. Does that make sense? Absolutely, right? So some of the stuff you're looking at, you're like, okay, well, that makes sense, right? You know, the worse your kidneys are, the more likely you are to come in for hyperkalemia. Right, that makes sense, right? Um, yeah, so again, we saw more male patients who were coming in. Uh, we saw more African-American patients. We kind of talked about that a little bit as far as being where the study was held, you know, where the, the actual sites were they were recruiting from tend to be more urban areas. So that's something you typically would see with that sort of thing there. Um Good. Let's give someone else a chance. I'm just going to sit down. I'm calling someone else. 24. I'm going to ask you a question. Let's see what you think. <laughs> Melissa? Stand on up. What do you think? Um, so when you say median and interquartile ranges, what does that mean? We say that. The middle value, right? Yeah. All right. So that's just the middle value. If you kind of lined up everyone from youngest to oldest, in this case age, you say, what's the, the middle value there? Perfect. Good. What about that IQR? What does that stand for? Uh, you want to know? Uh, sure. Why not? <laughs> I didn't mean just anyone in the room. Yes, sir. Is it like halfway between the middle and beginning? <laughs> Perfect. Yes, sir. Yeah. So you found an interquartile range. Where did you find that? Google, okay, that's one place you could find it. However, you could also look at the very bottom of the table here, right? So if you're not sure what something means, an abbreviation, look down and find out what it means, right? So right there it tells you interquartile range. What does that mean? A measure of variability. Uh, okay, what, what is it though? Oh, you divide the data set into quartiles. Okay, what is a quartile? Yeah, into fourths, right? So basically if you were to divvy up your, your information, right? So you have your median, which is right in the middle. You're going to have your... 25th quartile on one side, right? So you do 25 to 50, and then you're going to have your 50 to 75. That's the 75th quartile, right? Um, so basically, you're looking at that spread of the data, right? Remember, we were talking about parametric versus non-parametric tests. Usually with parametric stuff uh, that's following that normal distribution, we can use things like means and standard deviations to give us an idea of that variability around the number. However, with medians, you have to use the interquartile ranges, right? Because again, everything is basically ranked at that point, and that's going to be more seen with non-parametric stuff or non-normally distributed data. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, good. So again, if you see interquartile ranges, those are typically used with medians, and it's going to be more with non-parametric information or non-parametric data. Okay. Um, <clears throat> good. Let's see. Anything else we kind of noticed from this? Anyone just can raise their hand. Anything you noticed? What you notice about the the complaints people are coming in that were found to be hyperkalemic? Pretty non-specific for the most part, right? So you're kind of like they're coming in for dyspnea, nausea, vomiting. You know, a third of the patients were coming in for dyspnea. Would you normally think, okay, they're hyperkalemic? Right off the bat? Probably not, right? So it was one of those things where um, they tend to find it was very nonspecific. Did anyone read about the EKGs, what they found with that? Say it again. Right, and that's one of the things you think about hyperkalemia, you think about EKG changes, right? And so they found very few of those patients you know, actually had those changes you would expect to see. So you can't just go off of the presenting symptoms. You can't just go off the EKG. Like sometimes you actually have to do the lab test. So that may give you a lower threshold to actually order that test, order that BMP to actually get some information back, right? Because again, there could be people you're missing in those cases. There could be those uh, kind of false po or false negatives there that actually are hyperkalemic, but you look at the EKG and like, it looks fine. I don't need to do anything else. That may not always be the case, right? So that's kind of interesting. Anywho, and then what do you also notice about the possible causes uh, for hyperkalemia? Most of the patients tended to have. Right, you think chronic kidney disease, guess what? They can't process potassium. That's a no-brainer, right? That makes a lot of sense there. We you think about diabetes, why do, you, why do you think diabetes would be present in a lot of these patients as being the cause of the hyperkalemia? They get bad kidneys. They develop into patients with CKD eventually, right? Because remember, we know those um, those uh, nephropathies that occur, diabetic nephropathies that happen over time, right? So that makes sense. Uh, acute kidney failure that makes sense there. And the ACEs and ARBs, what do those do? I had to bring it back to drugs, didn't I? <laughs> 
They cause hyperkalemia because they do what? They prevent aldosterone from doing its thing, right? So again, they hold on to potassium. So again, if you have a hyperkalemic patient, one of the first things you want to ask them is, like, hey, what medications do you take? And look for those things like an ACE inhibitor, like an ARB. What other drug would you look for? Spironolactone, right? A potassium sparing diuretic would be a big one, right? Not just any diuretic. Most of those cause what? Hypokalemia, right? The thing like loop diuretics and thiazides will cause you to lose potassium, okay? See all these points they keep coming back? Can't just forget everything, right? Anyway, um, okay, so let's look at the actual results here. Let's look at the, the potassium levels. So uh, let's call on someone else. Number three. Felicia, stand up. I feel like I'm calling a lot of the same people. And again, it's truly <laughs> random, so I cannot uh, I can't do anything about uh, totally random chance. Okay, so let's look at the different graphs here. So the first one is, is telling us what? Um, that their uh, potassium is going down. Okay, but who, who is that that we're looking at? Which patients? Which patients? How, do you, how would you find out? Okay, so we're clue patients are uh, above six. So yes, they do have pretty severe hyperkalemia there. But the thing we always want to do is make sure you figure out what specifically is this graph telling us. So how do we find that out? You go down to the legend, right? So figure one, or A right here, okay? Patients manage only medically. So basically that tells us, okay, these are people only getting calcium, albuterol, insulin and glucose, bicarbonate, all the good stuff. What were their potassium levels doing, right? And so what do you notice about this? Okay, so it's going down over time. How big of a drop are we seeing? Um, like one .5. Okay, so 1.5. So yeah, so we saw the average. You're starting up at you know above six, and then we're getting down to even after four hours, we're still above five, right? So they're still hyperkalemic. So it's telling, okay, well, we're seeing some drop, but is it enough of a drop? You can say it, right? Because again, what do we talk about with those, a lot of those drugs? You can sit down. Thank you. Um, what do we talk about that a lot of those drugs are doing? Are they necessarily getting rid of the potassium? They're shifting it intracellularly, right? So you just tend to find that you're not really dealing with the problem. You're just kind of using it as a, a more of a temporary sort of fix. You're just kind of putting a Band-Aid on it, so to speak. Now, looking at uh, graph B here, let's call on someone else. Number 34. Dylan, what do you think about this graph here? What is this telling us? Those are the patients that received dialysis, and it's a lot more effective yeah, so good. And you're looking at uh, between the two here, what do you notice about the starting potassium levels? They're similar. Pretty similar, good. And then the patients who got dialysis did what? Their potassium levels decreased a lot. And is that uh, something you would expect to see? Yes. Absolutely, right? Neodiasis is going to be the definitive therapy here. So, again, this makes sense, right? Now, nothing revolutionary is going on here. However, this may give you a little bit more credence to say, well, you know, I know if I have this patient who comes in hyperkalemic, you know, I can give them the normal stuff and give them calcium and give them insulin and glucose, but is it really going to fix my problem? You may have a little bit of a lower threshold to say, well, maybe I should get nephrology on, on board. Maybe we should try to give them a call and see what's going on and if maybe they'd recommend dialysis at that point, right? So again, maybe you have a lower threshold to refer out to a specialist, right? So that's something you may be able to take from this. Good. Um, I should have made you stand up, so we on you. Um, <laughs> just kidding. And then let's call on one last person for this graph here, number 12, which is... Ashley, you want to stand on up? Okay. So what is this last graph telling us? Um, those are the patients that only manage medically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> By the university. Okay, good. So kind of notice here that we have either they got monotherapy, two therapies, three, four, five therapies, right? And so what do you, what do you notice here? There's really not a huge difference between them all, um, where you use monotherapy or multiple. Yeah, so it doesn't appear that just by adding on more stuff that you're necessarily going to get a whole lot more benefit out of it, right? Now, what do you notice about the number of patients who got one therapy versus, say, five therapies? How many patients? How does that compare, do you think? How many patients? Um, yeah, so, I mean, how many people do you think just got one drug versus how many people do you think got like, all five drugs? Because um, I... if you see a patient, do you normally just say, I'm going to give you everything all at once? Or do you start off with one and then maybe move on to two? 
Yeah, you increase it over time, right? So again, you find fewer people probably going to get all five of those. So again, even though you're not seeing a difference here, we may not have the power to actually show that difference, okay? So you can look at this and say, like, well, it looks like a bunch of gobbledygook. It doesn't look like one really is superior to any of the other ones. So again, you may not be able to take a whole lot away from that because again, they didn't even do the comparison statistically to say whether there was a true difference or not. But just eyeballing it, we probably say there probably isn't, right? There's a lot of overlap from these uh, numbers here or this, uh, these uh, graphs. Thank you. Let me sit down. And that's kind of borne out because when you actually look at the other uh, graph here, which is kind of an interesting one, you don't see graphs that look a lot like this uh, very often. But you see here at the 30-minute mark, what is this kind of telling us? Kind of the breakdown of the patients uh, as to how many therapies they were getting. So what do you notice about the, the purple here, the five therapies? Over time, more people are getting more therapies, right? So again, that makes sense because again, you don't want to start off with everything. You want to be able to kind of give more drug, not just say, okay, I have a hyperkalemic patient. Let me give them calcium, albuterol, insulin, glucose, bicarb. Like you typically, you're going to go uh, sequentially in a lot of cases here. Um, some patients though got a lot of things all at once. Okay, who, who knows what was going on in that case there? There's no algorithm. There's no way to really control for that. So we don't know what was going on for that particular um, those patients there, right? Okay, very good. Um, and so. What else can we take away from this? Any other kind of um, observations here? What, other, what did they find out about the actual treatments that the patients were getting? What did most pay people end up getting? Oh, I just thought that the first charts that we looked at were interesting in that they like changed the percentage of people that got more and more treatment Yeah, so yeah, we were talking about that the, really the definitive therapy is the dialysis to actually get rid of the potassium in the first place. So certainly we've seen that the drug therapy is maybe not the most effective thing, which we you know, know that that makes a lot of sense based off of, you know, when you see these patients, you get it, kind of get a feel for it. But um, what about the actual drugs that these patients were receiving? What was kind of the breakdown? What was the most common thing people got? Insulin and glucose, right? And again, this have to be given together because you don't want to cause hypoglycemia. However, what did they notice happened to those patients who got insulin and glucose? Still got hypoglycemic, right? So again, you have to monitor for that sort of thing. You have to make sure to check their sugars afterwards um, to make sure you don't need to give them more, more dextrose to that point, right? Um, so again, that was the most common thing. What else was the most common? What was kind of the next most common? Bicarb is another big one, right? So a lot of people end up getting bicarb. Uh, a lot of people end up getting calcium. Uh, again, they don't do a good job of necessarily breaking down uh, those numbers there. So again, they tell you what the options were, but again, you have to dig down into the actual results to say, like, okay, what were the percentage of people who got, you know, uh, calcium, right? So what were the number of people who got beta two agonists, inhaled beta two agonists? That's, that's your albuterol there. Um, so again, it's a good idea to see. Okay, well, that kind of makes sense. You know um, what people are getting. There's no overwhelming one treatment that absolutely everyone got, and so again, there's a lot of uh, there's not a lot of standardization from that, right? So again, what anyone would kind of uh, say? What was your takeaway from this study? What do you think? Anything at all? He said, "I know the best way to treat hyperkalemia." We don't know what the best way is, right? That's kind of the takeaway is that, yes, it is pretty variable. It is um, not consistent from place to place. If you go to one hospital, you may get treated one way. If you go to another hospital, you may get treated a different way. Now, again, is standardization a good thing, a bad thing? Tip is good. If you know the best way to do something, you want it done that way every single time. So, again, this will give us an idea of, okay, well, we know it's pretty variable. What could we do from here? What's kind of the next thing we might, may want to do? Yeah, we could do an experimental study. Absolutely. We could say, well, let's try um, this arm of the trial, the have hyperkalemic patients just getting calcium, insulin, glucose first. And then if we need to, we'll add on dialysis versus other group, maybe we'll do um, so, sodium polystyrene sulfonate uh, first. And then if they need dialysis, we'll add that. You know, there's different ways you could organize it to where um, you could do that experimental trial to say, okay, well, what is the best way to, to manage this, right? A study may never be done, but this is at least what we can pull from, from this one right here, okay? Um, what do you think were some of the limitations? Let's call on somebody. Number 30. All right, Laura. Yeah. Um, there were a few limitations with this study. First, there was no set standard for um, reporting the data. Mm -hmm. um, and they, no institution report having like a hyperkalemia treatment algorithm, So, which may show like why there was so like variability in how they were being treated. Okay, good. Um, they also had a small number of sites and a very small sample size, um, and then they're also taught like academic hospitals mm. and so they're more urban locations. Um, so do you think if I did this study again, I did only rural institutions, how do you think that may change? 
Or do you think it would change? Uh, potentially. Yeah. Well, because you're talking about, like, the older, um, like, uh, health care providers okay. and younger. So they can maybe be treated differently, and they also have different patients um, that they may present differently or... Now, this, you may not know this, but um, if you're out in the middle of nowhere in a hospital, um, how easy is it to get dialysis on board? Oh. Maybe very difficult, right? So I'll give you a real-world example. You can sit down. Thank you. Um, real-world example. So, for instance, when I'm taking call for the Poison Center, I take call for uh, basically the whole top third of the state, right? So just above Orlando all the way through the Panhandle. And so I get any hospital. If a doctor has a, a poison patient there, a PA or an MP or anyone, has a poison patient, they can call up. doctor can get recommendations for what to do with that patient. Um, and so one of the really difficult things to deal with is patients who may or may not need dialysis, right? So if you have an aspirin overdose, if you have, um, you know, a lithium overdose, any of these things that may require dialysis, one of the big questions is where are you at right now? Okay, if they're in the panhandle and it's Sunday night at two o'clock in the morning, how likely are you to get that nephrologist to come on in? Not very likely, right? You'll find out that it's very difficult to get some of those specialists to come in. They'll be like, I'll, they're not dead yet. I'll see them in the morning, right? Uh, versus if I'm in an academic institution in the middle of a downtown urban area, I got nephrology residents on call 24 seven. I can get dialysis started any day of the week, any time of the day. Okay, so again, you may find that if you were to do this study somewhere else in a different sort of geographic area or different types of hospitals, you may find the results would be very, very different. Fewer patients would actually get dialysis and more of them would have to rely on medical therapy, right? So the results could change pretty drastically there. And so a lot of times what I have to do as a consultant is I have to make the argument whether or not I think someone really needs dialysis. And so I've had many a call with nephrologists on the phone and be like, this patient is going to die. They will not be here in the morning if you don't come out here. And to make that case, I have to argue with them that I should come in and get that dialysis started because it was, you know, potentially life-threatening ingestion. So, um, again, it all depends on where you're at. And I hate to say that just by going to one hospital, you may be more likely to die than another hospital, but that's kind of how, how it is in some cases. Anyway, any other limitations anyone kind of noticed with the study? All right, very good. Um, let's see, any other last-minute questions or things you found interesting about the study? Any thoughts? Any questions about how we're kind of going through this? Or anything I left unanswered when you were kind of perusing this? Nothing at all? I'm trying to think if there's anything other really interesting here. So again, just kind of think about these things. Like think about where the study was uh, done at. Think about if I were to change this aspect of it, how could that change the study results, right? Because that can be playing a big role. All right? Think about those limitations, confounders, et cetera. Now, um, so you have uh, an online session for this afternoon. So I expect everyone to go to YouTube and watch those videos. Their links are posted up on, on Canvas there. We'll meet tomorrow. We'll do one last little uh, tiny lecture. We'll do another journal club. That'll be for the vitamin D and cancer prevention. It's kind of another, the other topic that a lot of people wanted to see uh, some journal clubs on. And then we'll have our review. Any questions? All right, I will see you guys tomorrow. Enjoy your afternoon of watching Epi Bio Lectures.